I'm with Gavin, Victor Kilo 2 Bravo Alpha X-Ray. You've just come back from Heard Island. What was that like? Oh, it was amazing. Um, for me, my job there was to work as one of the field teams. So we had a, a science team of two of us. And our objective was to get out and around the island as much as possible, uh, collect the uh, geological samples, also picking up uh, water samples wherever we came across the glacial streams, freshwater streams, um, and the other one we're after was uh, soil samples. So um, under the glacier edges, picking up dirt there, because um, as the glaciers are melting, there's potentially stuff dropping out of the ice that will spawn. And so we were picking up from there. Um, so we're pretty much from after day two, once the camp was set up, uh, Fred and I were planning day walks. Uh, we headed out around Walrus Bay, which was just uh, an amazing day. Just first day getting used to being on Heard Island, you know, getting the sort of lie of the land and coming across the king penguins that would walk up to us and the gentoos and then we come across fur seals and, and then the, the larger elephant seals. Seeing the Heard Island cormorant for the first time around the bay as well and, and there's a um, macaroni and rock hopper colony as well that we came across there. Second day, um, we had some defined um, sampling areas that were imposed on us by uh, Antarctic Division under the permit. And our second day walk, we decided that we would go as far south in that area as we could around Atlas. So it took us all the way down to the Borderson Glacier. Um, and I think it was by about lunchtime, Fred and I were just, Fred said, turned to me and said, this is sensory overload. I just, I can't handle any more new stuff. You know, we, we'd uh, walked across the Nullarbor Plain. We'd um, walked uh, down Southwest Bay. We'd rounded Erratic Point and uh, we'd seen all the wildlife on the way down. And Erratic Point, we just came across a whole lot of uh, plastic debris on the island. Uh, and yeah, that was almost, almost disappointing. There was, you know, we did account for um, Tangaroa Blue who are a, a not-for-profit that measure marine debris and uh, we'd agreed to do a count on Heard Island and just, you know, for the record, you know, 56 drink bottles, um, four fishing floats, uh, what else do we do, four fishing floats, um, about eight or nine uh, uh, hand cleaning product bottles, um, just the volume of rubbish blew us away to be honest there are a lot of fishing ropes on the beach as well just still coiled but just washed onto the beach so this was stuff that was left behind by other people or stuff no, no, that's this washed is, up this is washed up so we noticed on the western side of the island there's a lot of debris wash on the eastern side not as much um gas cylinders uh, you know just they corroded 44 gallon drums corroded um so that yeah we were surprised at the level of, of that rubbish uh we went all the way down to the glacier um and came back up and we were really fortunate enough to come across the king penguin colony um, up near the base of schmidt glacier about two maybe three thousand penguins and even though it was late in the season for the kings there were still chicks in their little brown down jackets and and it was just for us it was just such a different experience to be able to see them so we did four or five day walks and then we were lucky enough to have the Braveheart crew take us up by Zodiacs up to Lawrence Peninsula, northern end of the island. Um, they dropped us off at Sydney Cove and we stayed up there, just the two of us, for two and a half, or three and a half days. Um, and we sort of called it the remotest campsite in the world. And I guess if you think about it, it really was. Um, just two of us. Um, we were lucky the Apple, the, the Apple shelter that AAD put in in 87 was still habitable. Um, and we were able to live in there for a couple of days. We had, I had an objective to climb Mount Dixon, which only 660 metres, but it's, uh, it's windswept, it's got snow on the top, snow and ice. Uh, unfortunately, the day we went to give it a go, the winds were just too high and we got to about 420 metres, I think it was, and we backed off. It just was, Fred was getting blown over. It just wasn't worth us going any further. And the permit required us to stay as a two, so even though he said, oh, you go ahead, that just wasn't going to happen. So, uh, yeah, so that was a back off. But even there, we were able to collect rock samples. That's probably some of the highest rock samples that have been collected on Heard Island, and they're on their way down to University of Tasmania for analysis um yeah the samples that you you, you brought home and and brought to Fremantle harbour yep. where are they where are they going to so all of the rock samples are heading down to uh like i say down to the university in tasmania and they'll be used by uh, um, somebody doing a phd uh down there 
the water and soil samples are on their way back to the US, so they're sitting in customs bond now, and they'll be freighted away in the next 10 or 12 days, head off to California. Uh, Bob has contacts that will make use of them. Um, he's sort of in that in that sphere, and he'll be distributing them out to people for analysis from there. Uh, so that's where they've gone, unfortunately. You know, they've, they've left Australia, I guess, but that's the way it is. That's where the analysis will take place. Uh, I think there's an intention to put together a publication once we get gather the, the material back um, maybe in 12 months time and, and just put the scientific piece of the, the project uh, to the end really. Yeah. So how often do scientists actually land on Heard Island to actually do what you did? Uh, last time that I'm aware of was 2003. Uh, AAD had a team down there, they had quite a large team, uh, I think they were working in the Spit Bay area. Um, in Lawrence Peninsula in the apple we were in there was a note left by somebody who'd been there in 2000 so and then that was one of the things that really blew us away about being in some of the places we went it's like when did somebody last come here and when is somebody likely to be here again you know um, you know, it's, it's obviously 15 years it looks like since somebody was in the in Lawrence Peninsula um, we spoke to the AAD rep when we birthed at Fremantle and she wasn't aware of anybody being in there since then so you're thinking we're walking in there for the first time for 15 years um, and even that was interesting we were why do, why are the king penguins so trusting you know you only had to sit down and they would approach you um, and the skewers would come and land within a couple of meters of you or they would hover right beside you in the wind and yet the gentoo penguin would be timid and shy it's like the, some of them have a learned fear and some of them have uh, no fear at all so you know, it's those sorts of things that you know kept us guessing as well uh, Bob mentioned a, an occurrence when um, one of the glaciers has receded so much that a lagoon has opened up yep. and this is the first time anybody's actually seen this particular lagoon. Yeah, so that's the southern end of the island, Stevenson Lagoon. The I believe the glacier used to come all the way out to the foreshore. Well, we, when we went in there on the, on the Tuesday morning, we went in, uh, you, we came into the island by Zodiac and then we pretty much crossed the, the wave line that, where the surf was crashing. And you come into this lagoon and it would be at least a kilometre, a kilometre and a half back from that shoreline where the, the terminal face of the glacier is now. Um, so Fred and I did some work around the western side of, of that um, lagoon collecting some rock and water samples and Bob had the opportunity to go right up to Terminal Face and then we uh, all came back into the Zodiac again and went off to the eastern side and once again there's there used to be if you look at the maps um, that they give you as a, a map of Hood Island if you can get one is that shows that as a spit of land that stretches between two points and when we got there we were we were in at low tide and um, there was there was some there was some but some points of land still showing but there was definite tidal uh, so in the end I think we'll see the the southeastern corner of the island become an island of, of its own because it's essentially eroding away in, in those two areas which are where the land spits across the lagoon. So is there any research on what's happening with those glaciers where they you know where they went? Uh, there are some there are some publications where I've seen you know the, where the glaciers are receding uh, up at Atlas Cove interestingly so uh, there's uh, on the Corinthian Bay uh, what would be southeastern corner of Corinthian Bay uh, the Vassal glacier still fronts right up to the foreshore so there's no apparent recession of that glacier at all um, and yet some of the other glaciers on the uh, southeastern corner of Huron uh, are receding quite rapidly. Also, like I said, we went over to um, the Sail Glacier on the northwestern corner of our collection zone, and uh, it, it's definitely receded back from the shoreline. But uh, I was fortunate; I've been fortunate enough to also have some time with Graham Budd, who is one of the original members of the Anari team that was down there in '47 to '55, and he's been back many times. And so I've had a look at some of his comparative photos, and you can look at the. Uh, photos from 55, 72 and you can see the glacier both receding back from the shoreline but also collapsing height wise as well. So one of my objectives was to assist Graham and take more photos from points looking 
out over that glacier so that we can put them into the time series uh, so that we can see the, the relative movement since his last photographs of it. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting, uh, depends where you are, on which glaciers you're looking at on the island, whether they're receding and collapsing or still fronting into the shore. Um, about three or four days before we left the island, we went back to Corinthian Bay and uh, there'd been really strong winds and heavy seas that night and another slab of the uh, Bordeson Glacier had carved into the ocean and the wave action had broken it up and had washed all of the ice cubes onto the onto the beach and where we'd previously walked across sand we were now walking in ice cubes uh, waist high, knee high and, and massive things and at one point wave came in and washed those and you know we were trying to walk between them and they were pressing up against us so you know it's not a it's not a easy location to walk around so it can be pretty unforgiving you get it wrong you you've got to be on your game watching what's going on all the time yeah what's your um what's your most treasured memory just being able to get there um i initially went down there when i first signed up to go on the expedition i was hoping to be able to climb big ben um and that just uh, the way the expedition evolved that wasn't going to happen and at one point I was trying to make the decision and rationalise the decision why I would stick with the expedition and, or whether I should just pull off because my number one objective wasn't going to be there and my wife and I talked about it and I, in a way I wanted to go because I'm never going to get this opportunity again and yeah now I'm just so pleased that I went because I may not get the opportunity again but just what I've seen is the island is pristine apart from this plastic debris and the, the wash up debris that we're seeing it's um, yeah, not repeatable I don't think so I'm just pleased to have been involved to be honest. So you were a scientist through and through on the island did you touch a radio? <laughs> uh, let, let's just clarify the scientists through and through um, I'm an accountant and a project manager uh, I'm uh, experienced in the outdoors uh, I spend a lot of time uh, with rescue squads in New South Wales and I've been involved with search and rescue in New Zealand. Uh, the reason I hold a licence is more to make sure I'm safe. I, I got my first licence when I was in New Zealand um, and that was more somebody wanting to be able to contact me and, and make sure I was okay because I was doing a lot of solo walking and training a search dog. And when I shifted to Sydney back in 2009, uh, my mate said to me, transfer your license you know keep it current don't let it lapse maybe you'll have a use for it a little did I know that six years later um, I'd be joining Cordell Expeditions and um, I, I let slip to Bob that I had a license more because I thought I had to justify <laughs> I knew it was a radio expedition and at that stage it was 35 people going to Hurt Island and and there was a it had more of a um, outdoor scientific and radio theme and Bob came to Australia and we met and I mentioned to him that I had a license and it sort of stuck but one of the, when the team started meeting uh, with their Skype calls uh, probably three or four months before we took off um, I said to everybody look yeah I have a license guys but my objective is to be in the outdoors I'm an outdoors person and don't take this the wrong way but uh, if I'm seeing you in base camp then things aren't working for me I want to be outside of the tent <laughs> and uh, yeah I, I think everybody accepted that as long as I pulled my weight when I was in base camp then um, yeah I hope I hope they think I did so yeah it was a great trip so and that's where it went thank you so very much for your time no problem at all Gavin, uh, Victor Kilo 2, Bravo, Alpha, X-Ray, thank you so much. No problems.